I think, in making music with these sounds. It's, it's a way to creatively express what it means to be human as part of nature, fit into the natural world. It's easy to become amazed by how interesting and full and rich those sounds are. It's not just a little cheap or a little simple noise, you know, even something like the red-winged blackbird that we just heard. That's like a rich tone full of possibilities when you actually pay attention to it. Once you come to value a place, to value something in nature, you're going to want to preserve it. You know, that's one of the reasons that the whole environmental movement began in a way with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, when she wrote of this whole image of what if our springtime became silent with no birds singing whatsoever. There are birds declining. We don't understand all of the declines, but there's a fewer and fewer birds. I'm not so worried about massive extinctions of, of North American birds. I think where we, what we'll see is sort of extinctions from our life in the sense that it'll be much harder to see a lot of these birds. We'll have to go farther and farther from our homes to get to places where we get a lot of these birds. What we have is an entire continent of birds, North American birds, which some extraordinary portion of them are migratory, kind of bailing out for the winter and going to the tropics, which makes a lot of sense. Being a migratory bird is a hard life. They're on the edge. There's very little land that's set aside just for birds. Oftentimes, all that's left is what's managed by people, and coffee is one of those things that's kind of a compromise. It isn't the ideal habitat for the greatest diversity of birds, but it supports an awful lot of the original forest birds when the forest was cleared. And if there isn't something like a coffee plantation, you know, you ask what happens to these birds. I, I hate to think there have been a few studies radio tracking them, and they kind of wander around, and I suppose most of them die because they really, once you remove their habitat, they really don't have any place to go. Anybody in this country who is a, even a, an occasional coffee drinker and is at all interested in birds um, has a direct connection to a coffee farmer who maintains a nicely shaded coffee farm. And if they can be drinking coffee that they can be assured comes from a shaded coffee farm that provides habitat for these kinds of birds that they see out their window, then that, for many people, is a very nice connection. And so we're connected by this uh, phenomenon of migration, by these specific species that go back and forth, two cultures, two countries, one bird, so there is this natural, organic connection we could talk about that exists between farmers and coffee drinkers and birds. We're on the southern part of Costa Rica, about midway between the Atlantic and Pacific, you know, the rainforest has always been part of my life. Since I was a kid, I remember waking up in the mornings, hearing the sounds of birds, just the forest being such an important part of my life. The diversity, the animals. I grew up in this area, and uh, it's changed so much since I've been here. I remember looking out from uh, my home on Loma Linda, which is about two miles from the Panamanian border. Um, out to the hills behind Agua Buena, and as a kid I remember seeing those, those hills just completely forested. And a couple of years ago I remember looking out again and just seeing pasture up there, uh, a lot of erosion. The forest has been cleared for a lot of reasons. A lot of people came to this area to start subsistence farms that was part of the forest clearing. Later on they planted coffee. As the prices in coffee have dropped, they've been taking out their coffee and all the shade trees that provided a lot of cover on those hillsides and planting pasture. And so I would say that the most dramatic change has happened in the last 10 years. Around Agua Buena, from what I've heard, almost 40% of the coffee was abandoned in that community during the past couple years. This community has really been hit hard because coffee has really been the heart of, of their economic activity. There aren't really other things in that isolated region for them to do. Todo esto aquí son, son que son militares. Fue que chapearon esto. 
trabajarlo para sembrar piña. Y este café, esto se pierde. Ve, yo no soy de la finca. Entonces yo vengo y lo recojo, este que es para que no se pierda, para lograrlo yo. De seguro en varias partes se están sembrando piña, porque ahora ah, se oye decir que, que como la piña es muy chulo negocio, el mejor negocio, entonces pierden los cafés para comprar piña. Well, the pineapples are a good example of a very large scale farming system usually managed or controlled by a transnational corporation, comes in with, with no regard for the impact on the local environment or the impact on the local communities, but are responding to an international market. Deforest uh, and plant a single crop over large areas uh, that causes incredible ecological damage to that region and removes, you know, the, the native forest removes the local communities that were there before. My own ties to, to the community go way back. And I began, just as some of our interns are beginning uh, the, their relationship with the community, I began it as a student. I was down there taking a, a tropical biology course in Costa Rica, and we spent uh, about two weeks in the area. That was over 30 years ago. The experience I had both academically and practically as a farmer there were, were key to what I do today. And, and for me, it's so important to be able to hand that on now to, to the students who go and live in that community. I kind of learned how to do agroecology in Agua Buena, uh, studying ecology, how nature works, but applying it in agriculture. And I, I define agroecology sort of broadly as, as that very application of ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable farming systems. When I was there then, I remember that coffee was being introduced into the forest. Coffee is a challenging crop to grow. It's not just a matter of planting it and going out and harvesting once. You know, it's, it takes seven years or so before, once you plant a plant of coffee to get to full production. And, uh, and meanwhile, you're having to care for it, prune it, keep it weeded, keep the shade developed, all the parts of maintaining that system. And then when harvest comes, it's not one single harvest. It's actually anywhere from four to six different harvests, anywhere from two to three weeks apart. And you, they can only be harvested by hand. And you're having to reach in, grab the ripe beans, and leave the green beans. And you might work a 10 or maybe 12, 14 hour day. And at the end of that day, maybe you've made two or three dollars. And maybe you actually have made nothing. Because when you bring your harvest in, you realize that the little bit of, the, that it doesn't have any value. And so what they say is that our work doesn't have value. Within a short period of time, not much more than 24 hours after you pick them, the beans have to be delivered to the beneficio where they're they're pulped, they're washed. All of the pulp on the outside, there's two coffee beans side by side inside one berry. And all that pulp around the outside has to be removed. And then they need to be dried. And then after drying, there are some communities actually where the, the sorting of the good bean and the bad bean is done by hand. Most Americans have no idea how little the farmers get from all of their work. And the crisis we've had in coffee in the recent years, the market just dropped out. The price of coffee dropped the lowest it's ever been in history. And what happened is that the small farmers throughout uh, Central America and South America and Africa, the nations that have been historically coffee producing uh, uh, countries, found that they couldn't even uh, cover their costs. Kids had to drop out of school. People uh, went into poverty. It's really affected an incredibly large number of people around the world. With 25 million coffee farmers, 
And if you multiply that by five in terms of family members, 125 million people around the world who, who were affected by that price crash, that's why Oxfam got involved with this campaign. Just because of the sheer number of people whose livelihoods are dependent on coffee, Oxfam recognized that what we were looking at um, was not simply a collapse of the market, but the potential for a humanitarian catastrophe. It's important for people to understand, both in the coffee industry, government and consumers, that despite the fact that the price of coffee has recovered over the last few months, the coffee crisis is by no means over. You've got farmers all over the world who still can't depend on sustainable livelihoods over the long term because they are still extremely vulnerable to the volatility of the market. Like all commodities, coffee is cyclical, and when the price drops again, we're going to be in exactly the same boat. All coffee consumers should know what is happening to the coffee. They should know who are the ones that are making profits with the coffee, which are not the producers. We know that the market of coffee is dominated by four big groups. Those guys are the ones that are making the money. The f big four coffee companies, Nestle, Kraft, Sara Lee, and Procter & Gamble, purchase nearly half of the world's coffee. You don't necessarily see those brands on every bag of coffee in the supermarket, but those companies own other smaller companies. They own the means of production, the processing plants. They let the farmers absorb the risk of the price fluctuation. So what you've got when prices fall, farmers are the ones who are left vulnerable. From the standpoint of the corporation, if you're the CEO, your performance is going to get judged pretty much by what's on a graph on a piece of paper. The, the bottom line, that is the profitability of the company and the share price of the company. If those go down, your job is in jeopardy. So whether you're a good Christian or you care about the poor or you donate to a, a homeless shelter, that, that's irrelevant to the functioning of the company. You're going to get judged on the bottom line. So you want to minimize your expenses, pay as little for the coffee as you can. There are some farmers in Central America who in recent years have gotten as little as seven cents a pound for coffee that we will pay 11, 12, 13 dollars a pound for. And in a cooperative like the, the Aguabuena Cooperative, where there's six or seven hundred families that are members of that co-op dependent upon the co-op's ability to sell coffee and bring money back to the community. When the collapse happened, they were all hit really hard and to the point where the debt load that they'd accumulated through those uncertain periods previously just kept getting bigger and bigger and unmanageable. Over the last 10 years, the Beneficio has been losing money because of the low prices in coffee and this year they were not able to open. I remember going to that Beneficio when I was a kid and I would ride there on an ox cart and I remember it was just, it was a center of activity. This will be the first time that the Beneficio has not opened in 42 years. Para mí es, eh, pues muy triste, muy doloroso, porque los productores que durante 42 años eh, acostumbrados a entregar su producción a este Beneficio, Hoy tienen que andar buscando otras alternativas. ¿Quién le pueda jalar ese café? ¿Quién le pueda beneficiar o procesar ese café? Nos da nostalgia cuando vemos toda esta infraestructura, toda esta maquinaria paralizada, porque nos hace falta aproximadamente 10 mil dólares, 12 mil dólares para poder abrir y comenzar a trabajar y poner a caminar el beneficio. Actually, about a year ago, two of the farmers from the cooperative, Victor Mendez and Roberto Jimenez, came up to Santa Cruz to attend the national meeting of the United Students for Fair Trade. And after the meeting, they were over at our house and we were sitting around and we were talking about coffee and we often talk about the cafes and talk about Starbucks and they mentally had an image of it, but they'd never experienced it. They really didn't understand how coffee was such a key part of the American culture. So we jumped in the car and went to a block of downtown Santa Cruz where there are about four or five cafes within that block. And um, we went into one, we went into Starbucks and they were just sort of taking it all in. And they looked up the price board and they saw that a cup of black coffee sold for $1.55. And Victor took his pocket calculator out and did some calculations and shared that they were charging 100 times what the farmer was making on the coffee. 
you get about 35 to 40 cups of coffee from one pound of coffee. So the gross profit that's being made by that cafe, say $1.50 times 40 cups, they're making around $60 on a pound of coffee. Now the farmer at the height of the crisis was getting, say the cooperative would be getting 40 cents for that pound of coffee. So you're comparing $60 to 40 cents. And I could literally feel the blood surge between Victor and Roberto as they talked about this. And these are very calm, calm individuals. And I could feel the anger soar for them. And Victor turned to me and he said, we're pulling our children out of school. We can't afford to send our children to school because of this. No soy un técnico ni un economista, simplemente un productor, pero sí sé sumar y restar. Y lo que pude constatar es que nuestros productores recibimos aproximadamente un 5% del valor de eso que nosotros producimos. Regalado, nosotros no pedimos regalado, lo que pedimos es justicia, lo que pedimos es que se nos compre los productos que estamos produciendo con un precio más justo. Por años hemos vivido aquí y que no sabríamos hacer otra cosa, porque hoy lo que sabemos es producir, lo que sabemos es cuidar nuestra naturaleza. Que es una forma de pobreza la que se vive acá. Ya el café está en, ya, ya está en cosecha y no hemos podido recibir el café. No hemos podido liquidarle el café a las personas porque no hay liquidez financiera. Entonces la gente, la comunidad está sufriendo esa crisis. Ya le digo yo a los chiquillos y a, y a la señora, le digo, bueno, eso no se puede. Hay que ver cómo solucionamos el problema y abandonar todo. El café para mí fue un brazo derecho que me ayudó mucho tiempo y no puedo decir que, que no quiero de él, nada. Simplemente que una cosa es que no quiera y otra cosa es que no pueda. No puedo vivir con el café porque la situación del café no me dan para yo trabajar en el café. He pensado que tengo que cortar todo lo que, es, lo que se consume. Sacar de mi finca lo que yo pueda. Hice una, un invernaderito, que ahí tengo un invernaderito, tengo legumbres y salgo a vender esas legumbres para ayudarme en la situación de la casa y comer. Eh, produzco orgánico. Tengo ya el muchachito que ya está de 18 años. Él aspira mucho a lo que es la mecánica. Le digo, bueno, ya, Pito, le digo, aquí está. Usted, si usted aspira a eso, le digo, tenemos que ver cómo hacemos para ayudarlo. With the coffee crisis, the community begins to disintegrate and the men leave to find work outside the community. Everything is left in the woman's hands. So the maintenance of the family, the maintenance of the land and the farm, plus trying to find some outside income. And it becomes an impossible burden to bear. And what's wonderful to see is that the women are coming together and they're talking about it. Concepcion has really been one of the key leaders in that process. He's just one of those people that takes things on and, and reaches out to the other members of her community, what I'd call a real leader amongst the women of the community. Hay muchísimas familias eh, en, en una situación muy, muy difícil. Y sobre todo, los niños. Hay muchos niños que a los 14 años se van de la casa para ver qué pueden hacer. Muchas jovencitas a raíz de esto se prostituyen porque sus papás se han ido y no tienen el apoyo de, del papá para, para orientarse. En este caserío, que son como unas 40 casas, eran como unos 20 muchachos y ahora Solamente hay tres, solamente hay tres. Los muchachos no encuentran aquí razones, no encuentran alternativas y dicen, no, aquí no hay nada que hacer, aquí nos vamos. Cuando vemos que nuestros productos no valen y que la situación es tan incómoda, pues simplemente eh, nos, nos, nos comemos el cuento de que allá en Estados Unidos este, una gran fortuna y nos vamos para allá. 
I don't care how high they build the fence and how much IDs they require, people will live under the wire. Uh, if it means keeping their families alive and being able to get access to education and health care. So the ounce of prevention here is that we ought to make sure that the price we pay for that cup of coffee, that a good, a greater portion of that price is shared with the grower, the producer, the campesino that has toiled so effectively to make sure that that coffee bean can be enjoyed by uh, consumers in this country. I talk with a lot of people in California who are really upset about immigrants who are taking up the, the low-paying jobs there, but I don't really think that they're, they're getting the fact that these inequalities in the market is what is causing these, these people to have to go stand on the street corner trying to get some incredibly low-paying jobs. They would much rather have an honest way to make a living, to, to have some integrity, to have their own land, to be able to do what their families have done for, for generations. My first reaction to that is, is anger. These are the people who are taking care of the land that we all depend on. Um, and if they're not getting compensated for this incredibly important job that they're doing, we're all, we're all being hurt by this. These are the people who are preserving biodiversity, they're maintaining soil fertility, they're, they're the people who are feeding this part of the world. So. Yes, it's important that we look out for their interests. As you climb the mountain to where the highest quality coffee is grown and where the most beautiful and romantic views are, you see that the, um, the living conditions of these farmers, as you get farther and farther away from the little towns, it gets, gets worse and worse. And so while that's the most prized coffee in the coffee industry, these are the people who have the worst living conditions. It's really ironic and tragic. It's easy to get overwhelmed when you hear about how little money some people are making. It's easy to get overwhelmed when you hear from the Colombian Fair Trade Cooperative that some of its farmers have no other options but to start growing illegal drugs and get wrapped up in a business that they would just assume not be a part of. And the presidents of Colombia, regardless of who they were, came up and said, you know, we, if you want our country to sustain itself uh, growing something other than coca, uh, coffee is our traditional product. That kind of woke up Congress. And one of the things we pointed out to Congress, some of us who were very interested in this, was that the United States government had dropped out of the International Coffee Organization. So uh, we were able in Congress to uh, get the money appropriated to rejoin uh, the International Coffee Organization. Puts us a seat at the table. This is something that all the coffee producing countries really want us to be there. And I wanted to say that as a former uh, Peace Corps volunteer from South America, uh, this issue of development... Of Sam Farr's office, very Sam Farr is a congressman from Santa Cruz, California, has been an, an incredible ally, and I think from his own personal experience um, in uh, the Peace Corps in Colombia, really feels a strong connection and a strong commitment to this issue. The National Theater was built by donation of coffee from farmers. Small farmers, they came with just small quantities of coffee to put it to build that building, which is not only one building, it's part of our culture. And it's right in the middle of San Jose. So our economy starts with coffee. That's my interpretation, and that's what I think. And I would say that everybody in this country is very proud of that. If coffee disappears, I would say that part of this culture is also disappearing. People that go to pick the coffee, they have a social relation within the crop. I mean, they are picking the coffee, but they are also talking to each other they are talking about the community problems, they are talking about the neighbors, they are talking about everything. It was the farmers who have maintained these traditional shade practices that everybody, like 20 years ago, were saying, these are the backwards farmers that are forgotten about. You know, these guys are just out there in the mountains. They don't know what they're doing. They're still planting the old varieties. They're still farming the old way. And then 20 years ago, that was when all 
the extension came and said, we, if we're going to produce coffee, we got to produce a lot of coffee, right? And we got to cut down the shade trees and we can triple your volumes and triple your, your yields and you can make a lot of money selling to conventional coffee markets. So people did this all throughout Central America and, 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 and other places in South America. They cut down the shade trees and they intensified the coffee production. And what we actually saw here was a drop in the migratory bird population that a lot of people at Smithsonian and other research institutions have talked about. A coffee plantation that has a few trees on it can be called shade. Uh, depends on how you define shade. And, of course, if there's a few trees out there casting shade on the coffee, then someone could technically say that there's some, uh, it's a shade, shade coffee plantation. But we know that one tree in a coffee plantation does not good shade make. We need a mix of shade, we need native species, we need a certain height of shade, we need a certain amount of foliage that is there, uh, because uh, many of these birds are, are going after what they find on the foliage. So um, there is shade, and there is shade. And certified shade, actually, I think, is what the consumer needs to be concerned about if they're going to start buying shade-grown coffee. And there are not too many programs out there that will certify shade. But uh, the bird-friendly seal with uh, our, uh, our seal of approval on it, based on scientifically derived criteria, is one of them. As long as the world is treating coffee as a commodity, then the game is whoever is producing lots of coffee is going to drive the prices. And the poor people who are being you know, good stewards of the land and maybe even more carefully producing environmentally responsible and maybe even better coffee are not being compensated enough to compete with just the glut of coffee that's produced in these technified systems. This technology requires a lot of pesticides. This technology requires a lot of fertilizers. If the coffee were with shade, less nutrients required to produce. When the coffee is in this situation, the plant reacts, producing a lot of rains because of the stress that is taking place. However, this plant is going to be for less years producing than if it were under shade. Like this, it's going to be for eight or 10 years. Um, but if the coffee is with shade, it could be for 25, 30 years producing coffee. When the farmer sees that these plants are dying, he's probably going to change this for housing areas. The soil we have in, in this area is a very fertile soil because it has a volcanic origin. We don't need fertile land to have houses. People, they are trying to make money very fast. We don't need to be in a hurry. It's the opposite. We need to work slower. We need to think. We need to take care of this beautiful planet. This is our, our planet. This is the only house we have. We are linked to each other. What I do here affects people in the United States. What people do in the United States affects me here. So it's, it's the same situation for all the people who live in this planet. This is our planet, belongs to all of us. How to help, helping is part of it, but I think we need to start thinking about what we mean when we say help. Because when you tell the story of the tragedy of the coffee crisis and of the farmer who might be eating tortillas and salt or, or plantains and salt for a couple of days and, you, and, your, and your reaction is, what can we do to help this situation right now? It's important to back up and saying, well, it's not like you're just helping to save this person. It's actually you're beginning to repay a debt that has been accumulating for the last 150 or years or more. We as a country in the North have not recognized the value of the coffee beans that we're actually drinking. And so we have systematically underpaid farmers, workers, and even exporters and a lot of the different actors in the countries that are producing the coffee beans that we're drinking. And so the question is, how do we begin in a very small way to repay that debt? In Nicaragua, when the prices really crashed, the consequences were extreme. 
probably the worst affected were the workers, uh, the agricultural workers. They had been dependent on the owners of large estates for their food. I remember they marched down out of the mountains and they closed down the Pan American Highway and they demanded access to food and, and better education in their communities. And they also demanded um, access to their own land so that if something like this happened again, they would still be able to plant the corn and the beans and at least have something to eat. And, and people died during those marches. At the same time this was happening, Steve and Robbie came back from a trip through Central America that really opened their eyes to, at, the, at the consequences of the coffee crisis. And they started to form this organization called the Community Agroecology Network. And we started talking more and more together. And I said, well, this is what I see it's happening in Nicaragua. And he was saying, well, this is what's happening in, in, in Costa Rica and El Salvador. We formed CAN as a nonprofit to really look at both how do we network the communities with each other, and then how do we create a network between producers and consumers? And we are going to be selling this next year 7,000 pounds of coffee, which we don't know their total We were really impressed, amazed, moved by the relationships that had set up between the communities and our students. And I remember some of our first interns that would, six, seven years ago, would come back and talk about the coffee, the beginnings of the coffee crisis, and bring small bags of coffee to sell to their friends and to their family directly and send the money some way back down to the community. A, a connection, a commitment that we saw starting. And the idea that the students gave us of bringing coffee directly made us think about direct marketing and uh, building upon sort of the model of a, of a farmer's market but at, a, at kind of a global scale. I guess I've always been an activist for um, the things I'm passionate about and the things that, that move me. But on, on transferring here, I really wanted to get involved with um, the global justice movement in one form or another. And there was a campaign already on campus um, for fair trade coffee um, to, to get fair trade coffee into the UCSC dining halls. And so I immediately got involved in that campaign. The students I found very uh, polite and very uh, articulate. They came with a lot of enthusiasm and, of course, notions of making a difference, creating social change. And so that was very refreshing. But once I got a, a sense of what it really involved in terms of, of making this a reality, I then approached our purchasing department. And also at the time, we had a contractor who was running our food service and approached that contractor and asked if, if this was possible. And they were very interested at that time to do whatever we wanted as a client. Your school contracts are huge. When you have a 10,000 person campus and all of the coffee on that campus is provided by one coffee company, that's a really important contract to them. So um, they're listening now, especially when they know that, that we're working together um, and that it's not just one campus at a time, but that it's many campuses across the country. United Students for Fair Trade is definitely growing. It's a network of um, campuses all across the country. It's individual campus groups, individual students deciding that they want to work on fair trade issues on their campus. And United Students for Fair Trade provides a network. They know that they can call somebody when they have a hard day and talk about it. They know that they can call other schools that have the same coffee providers on their campus and they can work together in a coordinated campaign to target that coffee company and pressure them to offer fair trade coffee for their campuses. It's this amazing thing that the University of California Santa Cruz is buying their coffee direct from a community in Central America. That's an amazing, amazing achievement. But if you just leave it at that, I mean, you're forgetting the whole story. And the whole story can be, can be best brought to the students at the point of consumption. We have 6,000 students in residence. So let's say all of them have at least one cup of coffee a day. Um, and some of them have more. And then if you, if you add the, the faculty and staff and off-campus students that utilize our coffee cards, which is a lot of students, um, then I would say we're probably going through a significant amount of coffee, approximately 400 pounds a month. I think it's unrealistic to say if you have 20 million coffee farmers around the world or 25 million folks and, and a, a global market worth $60 billion, the CAN's going to be the only organization selling coffee. That's not the role. But it does help to provide some real direct links. 
and those experiences for the interns that go and down there and spend time in those communities and sleep on the coffee farms and meet the farmers and meet their children they begin to build those people to people relationships if you're going to go anywhere on the planet this is definitely the place to go so I mean, I didn't take a lot of convincing because uh, I'm in love with teaching English. My host family is definitely one of the best perks about being here in town. Umberto and Flori are their names, and they've been helping me on my Spanish, and I've been helping them on their English a little bit at night. It took me a while to get used to his, his Spanish and speaking to him, but he just would sit down and talk to me about how much he cared about the earth and organic agriculture and experiences he'd had with using pesticides and chemical fertilizers and how destructive those things can be to the earth and how he'd seen entire rivers full of dead fish and just those experiences that he'd had helped make him committed to organic agriculture and sustainable farming practices and that had made him a leader of this sustainable group committed to using organic products. Yo siempre he dicho que las capacitaciones no deben de ser solamente para los productores, los agricultores, digamos, sino que debe ser para la familia. Tanto los compañeros conyugales como lo, como sus hijos, para que haya una conciencia familiar. Con con esos químicos fuertes van a enfermar los niños, van a enfermar mascotas en nuestros hogares. Dos de mis hermanos fueron intoxicados. Esto fue una de las cosas que nosotros nos hizo cambiar porque realmente no queríamos morir. Queríamos vivir. Quizás nuestros padres por error, porque no tenían esa conciencia, no conocían. Pero ya ahora que nosotros conocemos, hemos tratado también no solamente quitar químicos, sino agregar un poco de lo que se había perdido, que son los árboles. Si un árbol sembramos, sabemos que ese árbol nos va a producir oxígeno. Estamos protegiendo la, la fauna, estamos protegiendo cuencas de agua, que es algo muy importante. Yo he sido agricultor toda una vida, no he sido una persona estudiada. Con miles costos aquel sexto año de primaria, pero sí me ha gustado revolcarme con la tierra. La agricultura es una aventura. El sembrar frijoles, el sembrar maíz o cualquier tipo de cultivo es como comprar un pedacito de lotería. Que dice uno, tal vez voy a pegar. I made a point as part of my internship to work with Roberto on his farm and just at least tag along and see what he would do. So we milked cows, we pruned his coffee, we cut sugar cane, we made candy out of it. Compartimos tanto criterios como trabajos. Ellos se van contentos porque venía a cumplir una tesis. Mi experiencia con Los estudiantes han sido magníficas. Ellos han sido unos muchachos que, bueno, yo los he valorado como uno de mis hijos. Tengo hijas estudiando, una hija, y espero que, que como yo le expreso mi cariño a ellos, otros se la den a mi hija. Que en ellos yo bromo, yo les hago... Los incluyo en la cocina, les pongo que me ayuden a hacer tortillas. Eh, yo quiero que se sientan en casa, en familia. The family experience for me was a huge part of the internship. I had never held a baby before. I got there and uh, I immediately I mean, I would say, no exaggeration, fell in love with this family. Some of the most uh, genuinely kind people I've ever met. And I, had, I got to live with them for 10 weeks. 
la cantidad de hijos que uno va dejando más en los Estados Unidos. Porque ellos vienen a alojarse a uno y uno es fuente de servir como padre responsable para ellos en el tiempo que ellos están aquí en nuestro país. We treat so many people in the world like these numbers and these statistics, and they're not. They're people with children, with grandchildren, with parents. And this system that calls them collateral damage of a free market, of a market that is totally insensitive to how you treat the land. These people have an intimate knowledge with their land, and that is completely not brought into the equation of how to do economics. The only thing that I want is este, trabajar de la misma mano y obra uno mismo y haciéndolo uno mismo sin pagar manos contratadas. It's a hard thing to read about while you're in school, but it's even harder to live with a family, to share celebrations, to share tragedies with them, and then come up with this rich notion of, of how huge the world is and then have it reduced to, well, that coffee's a penny cheaper. I come back here representing these people who will not, who will not come back to the United States. I feel like they're with me in whatever I do to a small extent. And also, I have a greater sense of how I feel globalization ought to be. I feel like it, it's a person-to-person, community-to-community idea. And um, it's not a bad thing if we treat people like our friends. Tenemos el servicio de internet para que el productor se comunique con el, con el consumidor en los Estados Unidos. Se les dio una capacitación a varios de ellos para que ellos vengan acá a la sala de internet y se comuniquen directamente. Cada uno tiene su perfil asignado ahí, la foto. One thing that I think is really incredible about fair trade coffee and um, fair trade direct coffee, it's a proactive and positive way to tackle issues of great complexity, but it's very simple. You just make a choice, and the choice is not that hard to do. It's, it's as easy as getting on a website or calling somebody or going down to your nearest store and buying fair trade coffee, and it makes a real difference. Las ventas a Estados Unidos tienen un significado muy especial para mí y una gran responsabilidad porque es la, la esperanza de, de, de una cooperativa, de toda una comunidad, porque nosotros, aparte de café, queremos vender la idea de que, es, de que hay una familia y una comunidad produciendo ese café y que, y, que, y que por medio de ese comercio podemos hacer una amistad. Here's this small town at the very southern end of, of Costa Rica in a fairly isolated region, and the farmers are able to process their coffee, get it roasted to very high quality, and package it and take it to the post office in their local community and ship it directly up to the consumers all over the United States. And within a week, it comes to the consumer's home. What's so wonderful about this Fair Trade Direct program is that it maximizes the power the coffee farmers have, and it really does turn the system on its head. It, it's fantastic. You know, the challenge, of course, would be to make this happen on a large scale. Not only is the farmer receiving you know, a fair share of what the consumer pays, the consumer oftentimes gets the coffee at a better price than they would normally pay on the open market as well. Well, I heard through friends that uh, it was possible to buy coffee directly from the farmers. And I thought that was wonderful because then the farmers made the profit. They're looking at the environment and trying to sustain their living environment, making it better, more diversified, more healthy. It's not something that they read in a book about how nice it would be to preserve this environment. For them, it's very real. It's easy to read through books and, and insist upon certain people living a certain way because I feel that biodiversity is important, for example. But it's very different when you speak with these folks and they tell you, no, I, I agree with you, you know, biodiversity is very important. 
so that I can have a, a healthy living environment where I can feed my kids, you know, good foods. When the birthday of the year comes around, we can get a, you know, a birthday cake and maybe maybe a pig to barbecue, and, you know, um, not to offend vegetarians or anything, but you know what I mean. My family's from Argentina, um, so my sensitivity, I, I think, comes from a, an understanding that Latin America has been exploited for a long time by people that aren't from Latin America. And when I look at the can relationship, purchasing of coffee directly from a farmer to a consumer, I see a fair relationship that dialogues that says, hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? You know, what can I do to make things better for you and vice versa? If you really want to help some of the root causes of problems in the world, it seems to me that the United States consumer has to be, be aware that there, there is power in that little old cup of coffee. There is huge economic power because coffee is the second most traded commodity on earth next to oil. And we're in, we know, uh, we've set up foreign policy over oil. People have argued we've gone to the Middle East in war over oil. What I'd like to see us do as a nation is have as much attention to the issues of coffee growing as there are to oil production. Because I think it's just as important for the, for the future sanity of the planet that we, we sustain this earth. There's no single solution to the coffee crisis. It's a complex problem. It's going to have a series of complex solutions. But in terms of uh, one of the most concrete ways that people can contribute, it's through fair trade. Um, fair trade is not a solution for the entire coffee crisis, but it's proven to help hundreds of thousands of farmers. It's an easy thing for people to do here, and, and it makes a concrete and incredibly powerful difference. Fair trade is a certification system. Um, fair trade certified products, which in the U.S. are coffee, tea, cocoa, and tropical fruits, ensure that farmers in developing countries get enough money to keep their farms and stay on their land. More and more U.S. businesses want to be able to show their consumers that they're doing the right thing. Um, ethical consumerism is on the rise. There are many farmers who are selling maybe 20, 30, 40 percent of their beans at the fair trade price and the rest, because we in the consuming countries haven't pushed the market enough, the rest gets sold at that world market price. So the farmers are getting hurt by our lack of ability to educate the consuming public about, look, if you look for this fair trade seal, that makes a huge difference for the farmers, and it's costing you maybe a penny or two per cup. That's not a big price to pay. It's an amount of money you wouldn't pick up off the sidewalk if you saw it. Fair trade really has found its home within the specialty coffee industry. They realize that if they don't support the people who are growing the coffee, that they're not going to have anything to sell. The specialty coffee segment is about 18 or 20 percent of all the coffee that's purchased and consumed in the United States. About one-tenth of that, maybe two percent overall, is fair trade coffee. And there's a, a, a little smaller segment, which is fair trade organic coffee. And that's the segment that, that my company is interested in. So two percent, even though we're small now, we are growing faster than any other segment. I firmly believe that some of the best quality coffee in the world is coming through the fair trade system. Fair trade coffee does cost more. And that cost for the consumer, for the, a cup of coffee, is about a penny and a half. So it's something to think about, a penny and a half. Wouldn't it be worth paying one and a half extra pennies a cup knowing that the farmer who grew the coffee actually could make a living, could send their kids to school, could maybe buy medicine if they needed it. If you've really accomplished that craft, you taste the coffee in this funny little slurping motion with the spoon. What has been incredible with the experience in Nicaragua, and it's happened in other countries as well, is we worked with coffee cooperatives for them to build their own cupping labs, and it helped level the playing field. And so what they say is don't buy this coffee from us because we're poor f coffee farmers. Buy this because this is high quality coffee and it's, it's, since it's high quality coffee it, it deserves a, f a better price. And furthermore we hope to use this better price to provide opportunities for the members of our cooperative and to, to, to improve the quality of their lives 
and to sustain environmental quality from where this coffee is coming from. You have to remember that, that coffee is a commodity. And for big coffee companies, um, and, I, and, I, and I say this um, as a taster of coffee, not as a moralist, but, but the coffee quality is just not that good. It's pre-staled, and by that I mean it's uh, been ground up uh, and put in a can or in a, uh, in a package, uh, and it sits on the shelf for months. Consumers get it, and it's stale coffee, basically, but it's what they're used to. I think all my friends think I'm nuts because whenever I'm in the, the supermarket, I say, hang on, I'll be right back, and inevitably they find me in the, in the coffee aisle seeing what's there. Um, it, it can get confusing. It sounds complicated when you start getting all the advertising jingles and things that are on packages of coffee. But if they like the concept behind fair trade, which is that the farmer is given some sort of buffer against fluctuating commodity prices and there's a fair way of dealing between the developed and undeveloped countries, if they like that, then they go to the coffees that are on the fair trade register and they have certified fair trade on them. If they like the fact that the coffee is grown without chemicals, if that's something that's meaningful to them, if they appreciate the fact that their coffee is not polluting the local streams, because that's really the big issue. It isn't the poisons you get in the coffee yourself, but the environment that's being um, spoiled to get your coffee. If they believe in that, then it has to say certified organic. And in the same way, if they want to, if you want to think you're protecting biological diversity and birds and all that good stuff, then you see it is certified bird friendly or rainforest certified. So there's only three, organic, fair trade, and one of two different versions of shade. That's all there is. People say it's really complicated, but it really isn't. And if they go into a supermarket and they don't see the label, you know, if you can take a minute to ask to speak to the manager, a good supermarket manager will respond to consumer interests, not because he necessarily has, uh, you know, fair trade in his heart, but um, because a good supermarket manager um, is in his position to make sure that the products that people want are on the shelves. And when they hear from consumers that consumers will buy that coffee if it's on the shelves, and if it's not, they'll buy that coffee somewhere else, they'll respond to it. I've spent a lot of time writing and teaching about depressing negative things, about how all the bad things happening in the world and what's, how our society is using up all the resources and not paying attention to anything. I mean, there's plenty to be depressed about. But, you know, in making music with birds and listening to the environment right around is an easy way to start feeling some hope and it's not all gone all is not lost you know the silent spring has not yet come and it's not going to come if enough of us care about these things the evils of the corporate dominated system create positive conditions for us to go out and say we have an alternative in the future the dominant model will be our model that says you have to balance social equity, environmental sustainability, and profitability, rather than subordinating those first two to profitability. It's just a more intelligent, uh, more heartfelt way to do things, and it will be the dominant system of the future. I'm confident of that. Días anteriores escribía algunas cosas sobre de las que yo deseo y quiero. Creo que no son grandes cosas, pero deseo poder vivir feliz, en paz con mi familia, trabajar en la finca, seguir trabajando en la finca, porque a mí me gusta trabajar en la propiedad, en la finca, yo me siento libre, yo me siento eh, sin, sin estrés. Y veo que las plantas están bonitas y todo está lindo. Y yo me siento como orgulloso de que, de que estoy creando plantas bonitas y que son muy naturales y que son muy saludables para mí, para mi familia. Esta sería la vida ideal, pero tengo que vivir la vida real ahora. Pero espero tener mi vida ideal. Esta que comento, sencilla. No necesito grandes cosas, pero sí, sencilla, pero libre. Eso es lo que yo espero. Yo no sé olvidar como lo hiciste tú, te has clavado conmigo en mi mente. Como si fuera ayer, 
pues yo no sé olvidar como lo hiciste tú. La 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 pues yo no sé olvidar como lo hiciste tú. Thank mm -hmm. you.